Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today I'm going to talk about my paper that I recently wrote. Um, it's called Uses and Abuses of ARIMA in PPNR Modeling and Risk Management, Why Not to Fear ARIMA. Uh, first off, I would like to say the title's really long. <laughs> it kind of meets the joke of academia and how they always have really long titles. Um, but the paper is pretty specific, which is why the title is so long. Second off, I just want to take the time to kind of state that this paper isn't necessarily directed at any bank that I've worked at. Uh, this paper is just directed at the industry in general. Uh, I've worked at, I mean, you can look at my LinkedIn. I've worked at two different banks. I've worked as a consultant. And as a consultant, I mainly worked for one bank. And I learned a lot about their internal practices. But again, this isn't like a specific issue I'm looking at for one bank. This is kind of an industry-wide problem. So kind of what, what is my paper about? My paper is about the use of ARIMA models, which are typically used to model like PPNR, which is pre-provisional net revenue, which stands for more or less banks have to, have to model what's on the balance sheet. And then a lot of times the models that are used for PPNR um, are used in what they call CCAR, which is like Comprehensive Capital Assessment Plan, Assessment Review, something like that. They want to make sure that the banks have enough assets on hand in case a financial crisis occurs, that the banks can prevent a crisis from happening with their clients, with their bank, won't affect the U.S. economy, won't affect the global economy. And so anyways, this paper is on the use of ARIMA, which is a autoregressive integrated moving average model. When I say ARIMA, as I point out in the paper, I'm not necessarily talking about only ARIMA. I use ARIMA very generally as any autoregressive model, any moving average model, um, combination of those, an ARMA model, uh, any model with differencing. But again, I like to use it as a very broad concept. And the reason is, is because a lot of times a model itself um, when you're modeling, you don't just dive in and say like, hey, I'm going to build an ARIMA model or I'm going to build an autoregressive model with uh, differencing. Like you have to look at the data and figure it out. So to start off with, just to kind of cover the methodology of the paper and how it's set up, um, doing PPNR analysis I've done at a couple banks. But the problem with doing this for a paper is that banks do not want their data ever released. And so I couldn't use any actual banking data. Um, so the way to get around this, I used what I had, which is stock market data. I've heard criticisms about using ARIMA on stock prices. Uh, I'm going to ignore that entire topic for now. But more or less, is what I did is I modeled stock prices with the macroeconomic variables that the Fed actually gives the banks for CCAR testing. And then, like I said, we modeled a few different, um, different stocks. So I modeled Citibank as one of them. I developed the model. And then we did different types of testing on different time periods. And I used nine quarters, 12 quarters, and 16 quarters. So you can see the stability over time of the model. Um, again, testing ARIMA is kind of a controversial topic in general. But again, testing for nine quarters is very logical in the fact that the Fed requires that you test for nine quarters. So the paper more or less doesn't prove anything new. Um, the, the paper points out three key issues with modeling PPNR data using ARIMA method, and this applies to ARIMA and time series modeling in general. Uh, it covers differencing, it covers overfitting, and it covers variable selection. And so I just want to cover them quickly. I don't want to make this an in-depth, more or less regurgitation of my paper. Um, you can go and download my paper. I'll throw a link in it below. Um, you can go down and look, download it, read it. Let me know what you think. But more or less, this gripe and complaint of mine of why I wrote the paper is I see that the ARIMA model is in kind of two camps. There's people that just love it and they blindly apply it to literally anything that is time series related. And then you have the other camp that is so entrenched and hates the use of ARIMA because, because they think the model itself is unstable, it's unreliable, it's complete garbage, and so they refuse to reuse ARIMA. And like I said, my experience just doesn't come from working in a bank. Um, for those of you who you can see on my channel here, all these different videos I make, I network a ton, I talk to bankers all over the US. I actually interviewed with somebody at a bank who was talking to about modeling PPNR for a position, and they were telling me more or less how ARIMA is being used by no banks. It's the worst model in the world. It's so unstable. They just can't understand it. 
And so I started talking to them about you know the risks of using Arima, uh, how you would fix that, why you would use it, and they would not listen. And so I ended up getting a job offer. Um, I just turned the job down. I didn't really tell them why. I didn't want to say, you know, it sounds like a great bank. You guys sound like great people, but more or less, you're too stupid to use a basic model. Like Arima is very, very basic. It has complexities, but really. To be a statistician, to be someone modeling in a bank as a developer, you should know this. If you don't know it, you shouldn't be working there. So that's just plain and simple. But the three issues are differencing. So you have people that over-difference data. And so for those of you who don't know, data needs to be stationary so that you can model it. Um, I won't go into why it needs to be stationary, but more or less you need the data to be stationary. And so I see people that start off and say, okay, I used the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Um, it wasn't stationary, so far I differenced it, and now it's stationary and now I modeled it. Or maybe I had to do two differences, I had to difference it twice, and then I modeled it. But there's no consideration or no one's looking at the details. Nobody's looking at other methods. So for example, Arima only fits, you have like a spectrum, right? You can use OLS or corrections two OLS coefficients to make them efficient, but you can use those to model different time series. Um, some situations it's not appropriate. Um, a lot of times from economics, we understand that there's like an autoregressive trend within the data. So we know that there might be a mean reversion in the data. There might be more or less a drift in the data. There's different trends and characteristics that we can pull out and we can model into an ARIMA structure which is one of the advantages of using Arima, but you use Arima because it has theory, it has logic, you have to understand the business and the statistics, you can't just model these blindly. The other approach would be looking at co-integrated relationships, which more or less means the relationship between the variable that we're modeling and the variables that actually go into the model, they do not have to be linear. And so this freaks people out because in school you learn about linearity, everything has to be linear, everything is a linear relationship, and we hardly ever touch nonlinear models. And so people freak out and they run and they hide and it's ridiculous. Um, there's definitely, definitely nonlinear relationships in economic data. Um, an example would be using like an error corrective model. Uh, again, you have to know the economic theory. You can't just blindly apply stuff and be like, oh, it passes these four tests, so therefore we just use it, um, which I'll come back to later. So the differencing is a huge issue because people just blindly difference data and then they model it and then they end up having models that fail. You have models that will pass the nine quarter, fail the 12 quarters, and pass the 16 quarter. But you'll find different combinations of models that fail and pass. And it's so ridiculous that I actually had a colleague, when we would look through models, it was great to find the model that all these models passed last year and we're looking at them. And we try to see who could get the worst p-value. So we would get p-values like almost at one. And it was just incredibly, I guess, eye-opening as someone coming out of graduate school, looking at p-values going from like 0 0.001, like extremely significant, and then just blowing up to like 0.9. It was just crazy. And so it was fun, right? But at the end of the day, it really got me thinking, why is this happening? Why are these models blowing up? It's not my job to build the model. It's not my job to fix the model. But at the end of the day, I wanna know why is this happening? What can we do as a bank to improve this? And so I started digging into this and this is why I wrote this paper. But differencing is a big issue because you select the wrong model structure. So in some scenarios, you should use Arima. Um, in other scenarios, you should not use Arima. There's no need to use it or it's an inappropriate structure for that model. Um, so then the other issue we run into instead of differencing is overfitting. And so I, when you fit a model, you start learning as you play with the structure, um, you look into the theory, you try to think things through, you start seeing that you can add autoregressive terms and you can add moving average terms. And what happens is a lot of times, as this is publicly known, but yet developers just don't do it. They don't realize when you add like an AR term and an MA term, a lot of times they'll start canceling each other out. And I've seen, as mentioned in the paper, I've seen a model that had like five or six moving average and AR terms. So these are not variables. These are lags of variables or their moving average of the error terms. But the issue is these aren't actual values in the data. And so the fact that you have one actual variable from the Fed 
and like five or six others that are MA and AR terms, modeling some value, some account balance is just absurd. And the sad thing is, is we, some, I've seen this in practice, it was being used. And then after I saw it being used, the model failed. And so they came back and they said, hey, you know, we don't have time to look at it. Dimitri, can you look at it? You know, we're too busy. I said, no problem. So I pull up this model, I look at the model. I'm like, what, what's going on? Why is there so much garbage in this model? This doesn't make any sense from an economics or finance standpoint. Statistically, it doesn't make any sense either because all these terms are canceling. We ended up with a model, I corrected the model, had one input variable, had one output variable, and had one term that was either an AR or an MA term. That's it. We used the model, the model passed. We tested the model again on another cycle. The model continued to pass. The first model failed after one run, and again, it's because the model was overfitted. So there's no easy test to test Arima. You can't just like plug stuff in and go, bam, uh, this value came out and it's overfitted. Um, the third issue being variable selection. And the best example I can give, which I give in the paper, comes on to interest rates. And the reason is, is because a lot of times you have some variable you're modeling. Um, you find logically, like maybe you're, maybe you're modeling like, I don't know, mortgage assets on the book. And you're looking at it and you're looking at, okay, different interest rates all make sense to model it. But that's where you fail. The developer just more or less picks ones that maybe have the best correlation, information value, and they just model it. And then the model fails. And then they don't understand why the model's failing. But what they don't understand is that you need to look at it. And so I remember doing a model at one of the banks I've worked for, and I sat down with this guy in this business and said, all right, you're the business guy, you know everything about the business, tell me this. What type of uh, more or less real estate do we have? Is it residential, is it commercial? Uh, what's the average duration of these uh, different mortgages? Are they 30 year mortgages, 15 year, 10 year? You know, are they fixed, are they floating? Like, what are we looking at here? And so I sat down for probably about an hour or two with this guy. We figured out all these details about the account. I went back to my desk to develop the model. I looked through them and saw that, you know, this one, for example, it was like a short term rate was super correlated, but I thought about it and thought, okay, the majority of the loans are long term loans. They're not quick short loans that are gonna be rotated quickly and be affected by a short term interest rate. So we ended up picking another interest rate, which was a long term that matched more or less the duration of the loan portfolio we had. And again, the model did extremely well. I didn't pick more or less the most correlated one. I didn't pick you know what tested the best statistically, but I picked the one that logically made the most sense. And interest rates are a great example because there's so many different rates and there's so many different things that go into rates. It's not just black and white. You have yield curves, you have convexity, you have all these different topics that all matter that determine exactly how the rates are going to like spread, diverge or converge over time. And that affects more or less your portfolio and your portfolio is going to respond closer to the durations that you're looking at when you're modeling an account that's closely related to interest rates. That being said, this applies to everything. If you have two or three different variables, they're similar but they're not the same, then you need to figure out why are they different? And you need to figure out which makes the most sense for modeling that. And so that's kind of the third point. And to wrap up more or less the paper is I wanna say, I, I'm really disappointed somewhat in general. This is not even banking related. I've sat in tech seminars. I've sat with companies that build software that do statistical analysis. I've talked to people in marketing, do marketing analysis. Again, I work in finance. I've seen everything. I've seen people that model anything from you know financial models to things that are modeling marketing to companies that are using more or less programming, like models to develop in a program to do a specific task for a tech company, automating systems, automating processes. And the problem I have is that people don't take the time to really understand the data before they model it. And I think one of the worst practices I've ever seen in statistics is people say, Dimitri, I ran X, Y, and Z statistics test. It passed, it was significant. Therefore, we plugged everything in and this is the model. That's horrible, that is terrible. You know nothing about the model. You don't understand why it's modeling that way. I mean, a lot of times you aren't even looking at the coefficients to say like, the coefficient is 12. Why is that significant? Is it a scaling factor? If there's multiple variables in an output, why are those magnitudes of different coefficients in there? Do they make sense? Um, 
And again, it's just, it's so frustrating because I've seen people with PhDs, I've seen people with master's degrees, and they all blindly build models, at least the ones that aren't very good, blindly build models. And these people could have, you know, a PhD, 15 years experience, and only worked in one more or less type of modeling, whether it be in tech or um, finance or marketing. And they use the exact same methods every day, and yet they don't stop to think about the implications of the model itself. They don't really think about how they're building it. And they don't come to the final point that I have, which is more or less something I've learned a lot from listening to Emmanuel Derman, who's one of the leading financial engineers. Um, him and Paul Wilma, again, which I've mentioned before, came up with the, I think it's like the Modeler's Manifesto, and or it's like a financial engineering manifesto. Anyways, and one of the points is more or less that this is not a science. Statistics is not a science. And the reason I would say statistics is not a science is because we are applying statistics to people. And people do not always follow a logical pattern or regime. And this comes into artificial intelligence too, where people are just blindly throwing data into models. Again, a lot of them don't understand what the heck's going on behind the scenes and they just accept what comes out of it. So it comes back to the modeler's manifesto, which is more or less, we are trying to approximate reality. We are not calculating it. And I don't know how many times I have to stress this. I see this everywhere I go. I go to seminars. I, you know, I've talked to different practitioners. I talk to professors, academics, and people blindly follow what they know. That's it. There's no thought, there's no progression. They don't stop to think and realize, you know, I'm just approximating some pattern over time, whether it's a stock price, whether it's, you know, assets on a bank's book or a company's book, whether it's, you know, the patterns of uh, trends that people are buying my goods and services or visiting my website or looking at my YouTube channel, right? I'm just approximating something with the goal of getting close enough that it adds value somewhere. And so I really wanna drive that point home and that's really the point of this paper is that ARIMA itself is somewhat complex. But if you learn the ins and outs of it, you really take the time to figure out what you're doing. You really think about the economics and the finance behind what you're modeling or the consumer behavior or the processes, procedures, things that people will use in the future. You really understand it and then you model it you'll do much better. Your models will be more stable. And again, this is the paper. You should not fear ARIMA. It's very good. It does great in very specialized circumstances of where it should be used. If you're abusing ARIMA and you're using it in places it should not be used, and you're trying to force every model, every set of data into the structure, it's going to fail. So that's kind of my take home. I hope you enjoy it. And as always, until next time. Thanks for watching my video. If you find it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe. 